Um, and, and of course, as John mentioned, I do work at Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and should anybody wish to come and visit the bookshop, you can sit at the round clawfoot table where Newman and Sandberg and Elmer Goods and all those people sat around and presumably drank martinis and smoked cigarettes in a true madman style and decided to found the, the Civil War round table. Um, I don't think that story is true, but if anybody wishes to say, I went to this, the Abraham Lincoln bookshop and saw the original Civil War round table, no one's going to stop you. <laughs> I believe the originals used to go out to a bar. I think that was, they needed the bookshop and they go out to a bar, and that is where the round table would occur. But thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, and it really is a privilege to be here. Uh, and uh, the, the program we're going to talk about tonight, uh, as, as John mentioned, it's Beers at Shiloh. And part of this goes to uh, uh, a little something from my biography. I had the great privilege when I was in graduate school uh, to spend my summers working as, uh, a, a, as a seasonal ranger, a seasonal park ranger to the National Park Service at Shiloh National Military Park and Corinth Civil War Interpretive Center. Uh, and that also was a great privilege. A uh, privilege of spending three summers working at Shiloh, living on the battlefield, uh, and going out and doing interpretive programs every single day for people that came to visit their battlefields, developing new interpretive programs and talking about things. I think when when I had finally finished my uh, three summers, my, my final uh, performance evaluation, which the government gives all of us, uh, said that I had done some 250 original battlefield program. So, talking about something that much, you, you get into practice. <laughs> you get a lot of practice doing it. But what we're going to talk about tonight was one of two particular battlefield programs that I got to develop while I was at Shiloh. And we talked, when we were there, I uh, talked to some of my colleagues about how much we liked doing battlefield hikes, and how much our people, the visitors, liked coming and seeing the battlefield. But well, one of the things that was frustrating for us, and possibly frustrating for the people, is that a battlefield hike concentrates on the terrain, concentrates on the site. It must be site specific. That's rule number one for a battlefield hike. But it also involves many, many thousands of stories of many, many thousands of people. And even within the hike itself, we might bring in 10 or a dozen primary sources that we might quote to say, this has happened here, here's a quote to illustrate it, this happened here, here's a quote to illustrate it. And it turned out there was some frustration. I certainly had it, I found my colleagues did too, is why do we leave any one of these fascinating people to quote someone else? They were all here for the whole thing. Why don't we just follow one primary source? Well, okay, first answer, a lot of the primary sources are a diary entry that said, uh, had coffee for breakfast, fought a battle at rain. <laughs> so that, that makes sense. But some of your primary sources turn into famous writers when they grow up. And they leave very evocative, very grim accounts of their experiences at the battlefield. And so we decided upon two programs. We would develop two, I would develop for them two programs that would follow one soldier all the way across the battlefield utilizing what he wrote, only what he wrote, a primary source battlefield. 
we thought about it. We wanted to have one Union soldier. We wanted to have one Confederate soldier. We wanted to have something to cover the first day of the battle. We wanted to have something to cover the second day of the battle. So very quickly, we pared down our candidates, but fortunately for the Battle of Shiloh and for the park and for the people that visited, there are two candidates. The two final candidates are two remarkable writers who left us remarkable texts about the battle. One of them is whom you see in front of us today, Sergeant Ambrose Bierce of the 9th Indiana Infantry. 19-year-old Sergeant Bierce here eventually becomes the bitter Bierce of the yellow journalism days, uh, San Francisco examiner William Randolph Hearst, uh, the author of The Devil's Dictionary, Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, uh, and more than one story that ends up as a, as I understand it, more than one story ends up being a uh, Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> uh, Beers is very good at writing. He was, he's the father, uh, maybe the stepchild after Poe, of the literature of American horror stories. He really is, he's, he's, he's after Poe and before Stephen King. Uh, as the quality of writing and the stuff he likes to write about. A sergeant at Shiloh who wrote an essay about Shiloh. Uh, the other one, the Confederate, and we're not going to go into that today because we're not going to follow him, but the, the Confederate is uh, a gent by the name of uh, a Welsh gent serving in the 6th Arkansas Regiment by the name of Henry Morton Stanley. Uh, who built himself a career in Africa after the Civil War, after deserting from the Confederate Army to join the Union Army, and then join, deserting the Union Army to join the Union Navy, and then deserting from the Union Navy to <laughs> return to England and eventually become a journalist and find Dr. Livingston, he presumed, uh, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in Africa. He also left behind a very evocative chapter in his memoirs, about the Battle of Shiloh. So these were the two that we that we did, and they turned out to be very effective. People really like to follow, walk across the Shiloh battlefield in the footsteps of Ambrose Bierce and hear the writing that Ambrose Bierce made of his experiences all the years later. Same thing goes for Henry Morton Stanley. So what I wanted to do for this program, what we're going to do for this program, Unfortunately, we cannot walk across the Shiloh battlefield, but people do like to take pictures. And they like to put the pictures on the internet and make them available if you ask them nicely to put in your PowerPoint presentation. So we will, we will interpret most of what we do tonight. I'm not going to spend much time at all going on about Ambrose Bierce. Our script, our story reads in about 40 to 45 minutes, so we need to get into it. Uh, in order to really appreciate what Beers is doing, is telling us. Uh, but I'm going to spend as little time as I, as I can introducing us to the program, uh, to the uh, to our person. But we do need to know a little bit about Ambrose Gwyneth Beers, sergeant in the 9th Indiana Infantry. Ambrose Beers was born in, uh, I should have written it down if I was going to quote it, Let's say 1840 or 1841. He's either 19 or 20. The time he um, and he was born, but he was, I do know where he was born. He was born in the southern Ohio hill country of Meigs County, Ohio, adjacent to the Ohio River, uh, very close to uh, Virginia at the time, and Kentucky, very close to uh, the institution of slavery. Uh, he grew up, born into a very religious, fundamental, fundamentalist Christian family. Fundamentalist enough that his parents managed to have ten children and name them all after figures in the Bible whose names started with A. Um, Ambrose turned out to be a very poor Christian. Uh, rebellious child, uh, kicked back very hard against this evangelical Christian upbringing fundamentalist Christian upbringing, and looked for every opportunity to get out of his family. By the time he was a teenager, his father had sent him to live with his uncle, his father's brother, Lucius Verus Beers. Uh, and Lucius Beers was as 
as fundamentalist in politics as his brother was in religion. Lucius was an abolitionist. Lived down in central, south central Ohio, and one of his abolitionist neighbors was a gent by the name of John Brown. And Lucius Verus Verus happened to obtain from the army as uh, as war surplus the the artillery short swords that he gave to John Brown, and John Brown and his and his boys later used them to dismember their political opponents out on Potawatomi Creek in Kansas, my old home state of Kansas. So this, obviously, at a very young age, Beers is exposed to very interesting stories that he would like to write about once he becomes, once he becomes an author. I don't think he ever wrote about his, his uncle. Spent one term as a student in a military school in Kentucky. He thought perhaps the military would be something he would like to do when he was a child. But again, he found himself wrapped up in the chains of his family, in the chains of his faith. And so when the war started, when the war came, Edward Winnett Pierce was one of the first recruits for the 9th Indiana Infantry, one of the first young 19-year-old boys that just wanted to get away as fast as he possibly could. He joined the Army, joined the 9th Indiana. Uh, the 9th Indiana was a 90-day uh, regiment. You, I'm, you're familiar with those early 1861 regiments. Uh, the 9th Indiana was a 90-day regiment. They traveled to West Virginia. They served in West Virginia, fought in a battle, and then came back to Indiana, where the entire regiment re-enlisted for three years. So that experience, combined with one term at the Military Academy in Kentucky, uh, qualified Ambrose Beers for the rank of sergeant. In, the ninth, in Company C of the 9th Indiana Regiment. Now, how did he get to the battlefield of Shiloh? Go over that very quickly. Uh, he was part, his regiment, the 9th Indiana, became part of General Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio. They were based in central Kentucky. They spent most of the fall and winter of 1861 and 1862 in a stalemate with General Albert Sidney Johnston's Confederate forces at Bolton. Kentucky. But following the victories by General U.S. Grant at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, General Johnston evacuated Kentucky, he evacuated Nashville, and General Buell, along with Sergeant Pierce and all those Union soldiers, without a fight, marched on down and they took Bowling Green and they took Nashville and all, all of that. It fell to them without a fight. Sergeant Pierce will tell us about that in a moment in his narrative. Then, once they were in Nashville, they got their orders to march overland to join General Grant and his army of the Tennessee at Pittsburgh Landing on the Upper Tennessee River, or the, the upper part of the Lower Tennessee River, I suppose, 22 miles from the city of Carnes, Mississippi. And once both of these armies were together, once of these armies uh, were together, they would advance upon Corinth and take that. That was the plan. That was the plan. And the morning of April 6, 1862, found Sergeant Pierce and the 9th Indiana Regiment and their brigade under Colonel William Babcock Hazen and their division under General William Nelson camped in the town of Savannah, Tennessee. That is where Sergeant Pierce will take up his narrative. We'll leap over the narrative just for hopefully less than a minute here to recite the rest of Ambrose Bierce's biography as quickly as we can. He did a lot. Uh, he did travel after the war out to San Francisco. He thought he would become an army officer, but when they only offered him a lieutenancy, he decided to become a journalist instead. Uh, and uh, much to the regret of many public figures who managed to cross bitter Bierce over his period with uh, uh, William Randolph Hearst and his San Francisco Examiner. Uh, he justly earned the definition misanthrope uh, and uh, made a lot of enemies and wrote a lot of very biting satire. And uh, since we're several generations removed from that, we don't feel the bite 
anymore. They're just really funny, cutting stories. Uh, but he could really destroy a public figure in his time. And he had very little compunction about doing it. But in the later part of his career, he did sit down and he did write his memories of the Civil War. And this was one of them. He wrote also about Chickamauga and uh, about the Atlanta campaign, and about the crime at Pickett's Mill. That's one of his better uh, uh, nonfiction historical essays. But I think his essay about the Battle of Shiloh, for the purpose of literature, is one of the best I've ever read. And it's worth reading it aloud. In order to read it aloud, I have done some editing, <coughs> taken some, uh, some liberties with the text. He wrote it to be read. He wrote it to be read silently. That means the original writing was full of very complex sentences and discursive dependent clauses that loses the theme of the the writing for on purpose and very effectively when you're reading it. But that, some of those need to be some of those needed to be cut. Also, it read in a little more an hour than an hour. And I didn't want to spend an hour reading it, so I figured you didn't want to spend an hour listening <laughs> to me read it. So we're going to try to bring this in at 40 to 45 minutes. It's a 12 part essay that talks about his experience as a 19, 20 year old sergeant at the Battle of Shiloh. We're going to look at one map, there'll be another map a little bit later, but one map just wanted to orient us to where we are going to be following uh, Sergeant Pierce through the battlefield. And again, quick shout out, the Civil War Trust makes these terrific maps, and you download them from their website, and the website says right there, if you can use this map, just use it, please cite us, please give us credit. And I love using them, they're great maps, and it's one more reason why we should donate Sorry. money to battlefield preservation, as we have done tonight. The Civil War Trust is one of the really fine organizations, the leading organization in battlefield preservation. Uh, I'm willing to take a few minutes out of my talk, a second of the talk, to, to give them credit there. This is the battlefield of Shiloh. By show of hands, who recognizes the battlefield of Shiloh as a map? Most of us. Most of us. Here's the here's the Tennessee River going north and south. Here's the battlefield. Here's the Owl Creek, and here's uh, Lick Creek, and, and then Snake Creek goes up there. Uh, this is a map of the second day of the battle, and so uh, General Grant's Army of the Tennessee will be over here, counterattacking against the Confederates there. General Buell's Army of the Ohio will be here, counterattacking. And Sergeant Pierce in the 9th Indiana will be in this area here, and they will advance through these deep, dark ravines, tangled ravines, uh, down the Hamburg Savannah Road until late in the morning of April 7th. They will have a very bloody battle with the main Confederate line in an area down here called the Daniel Davis Wheat Field. They get into a fight with the Crescent Regiment of New Orleans and the Washington Artillery famous Washington Artillery Battery of New Orleans. They end up in a hand-to-hand -hand fight over those guns of the Washington Artillery. Uh, and we'll hear about it from Sergeant Pierce. And, uh, but that's geographically where this is going to happen. We're going to show some pictures from now on, but we're really going to stay away from maps because we're going to concentrate on what Sergeant Pierce has to tell us. And that brings us to our story. That brings us to our story. As I said, a 12-part essay. Some of the parts read a little long. Some of the other parts read remarkably short. And when I read, when I'm reading a passage, it, I will uh, be showing us a uh, uh, an image of the location where that passage occurred. Uh, there will not be much discussion about the image or the passage. We're just going to let Sergeant Pierce tell the story. Uh, except in one or, one or two instances. So let us get started with Ambrose Bierce, What I Saw of Shiloh. One. This is a simple story of a battle. Such a tale as may be told by a soldier who is no writer to a reader who is no soldier. 
The morning of Sunday, the sixth day of April, 1862, was bright and warm. Reveille had been sounded rather late, for the troops were to have a day of rest. The men were idling around the embers of their bivouac fires, some preparing breakfast, others looking carelessly to the condition of their arms and accoutrements. Still others were chatting with indolent dogmatism on that never-failing theme, the end and object of the campaign. <laughs> Sentinels paced up and down the front with a lounging freedom of stride. A few limped unsoldierly in deference to blistered feet. At a little distance in rear of the stacked arms were a few tents, out of which frowsy-headed officers occasionally peered, languidly calling to their servants to fetch a basin of water or dust a coat, polish a scabbard. Trim, young, mounted orderlies, bearing dispatches obviously unimportant, rode amongst the men, enduring with unconcern their good-humored bravery, the penalty of superior station. Little Negroes, of not very clearly defined status and function, lolled on their stomachs or slumbered peacefully, unaware of the practical waggery prepared by white hands for their undoing. Presently, the flag, hanging limp and lifeless at headquarters, was seen to lift itself spiritedly from the staff. At the same instant, was heard a dull, distant sound, like the heavy breathing of some great animal below the horizon. The flag had lifted its head to listen. There was a momentary lull in the hum of the human swarm. Then, as the flag drooped, the hush passed away. But there were some hundreds more men on their feet than before, some thousands of hearts beating with a quicker pace. Again the flag made a warning sign, and again the breeze bore to our ears the long, deep sighing of iron lungs. The division, as if it had received the sharp word of command, sprang to its feet and stood in groups at attention. I have since seen similar effects produced by earthquakes. I'm not sure, but the ground was shaking then. The mess cooks lifted the steaming camp kettles off the fire and stood by to cast out. The mounted orderlies had somehow disappeared. Officers came dunking from beneath their tents and gathered in swarms. Headquarters became a swarming hive. The sound of the great guns now came in regular throbbing the strong, full pulse of the fever of battle. The flag flapped excitedly, shaking out its blazonry of stars and stripes with a sort of fierce delight. Toward the knot of officers in its shadow dashed a mounted aide de camp, and in the instant rose the clear, sharp notes of a bugle, caught up and repeated, and passed on by other bugles, until the level reaches of brown fields the line of woods trending away to the far hills and the unseen valleys beyond were telling of the sound. The farther, fainter strains half drowned in ringing cheers as the men ran to range themselves behind the stacks of arms. <laughs> For this call was not the wearisome general before the tents go down. It was the exhilarating assembly which goes to the heart as wine and stirs the blood like the kisses of a beautiful woman. Who that has heard it singing to him above the grumble of great guns can forget the wild intoxication of its music. Two. The Confederate forces in Kentucky and Tennessee had suffered a series of reverses, culminating in the loss of Nashville. The blow was severe. Immense quantities of war material had fallen to the victor, together with all of the important strategic points. 
General Johnston withdrew the Confederate Army to Corinth in northern Mississippi, where he hoped to so recruit and equip it as to enable it to assume the offensive and retake the lost territory. The Tower of Corinth was a wretched place, the capital of a swamp. It is a day's march west of the Tennessee River, which runs nearly north at this point, and it is navigable to this point, that is to say, to Pittsburgh Landing. At uh, where Corinth got to the river by a road worn through the thickly wooded country seamed with ravines and bayous. The Corinth Road was at a certain season a branch of the Tennessee River. Its mouth was Pittsburgh Landing. Here in 1862 were some fields and a house or two. Now there is a national cemetery and a number of other improvements. <laughs> it was at Pittsburgh Landing that Grant established his army, with a river to his rear and two toy steamboats as a means of communication with the other side. The question has been asked, why did General Grant occupy the enemy's side of the river in the face of a superior force before the arrival of Buell? Buell had a long way to come. Perhaps Grant was weary of waiting. Certainly Johnston was. For in the gray of the morning of April 6th, the Confederate forces, having moved out of Corinth two days before, fell upon Grant's advanced brigades and destroyed them. Grant was in Savannah, but hastened to Pittsburgh Landing in time to find his camps in the hands of the enemy and the remnants of his beaten army cooped up with an impassable river at their backs for moral support. I have related how the news of this affair came to us at Savannah. It came on the wind, a messenger that does not bear copious details. Three, over by Pittsburgh Landing are some low, bare hills. In the dusk of the evening of April 6th, this open space, as seen from the other side, would have appeared to have been ruled with long, dark lines, with new lines being constantly drawn across. These lines were the regiments of Buell's leading division which having moved up from Savannah through a country presenting nothing but impassable swamps in the rank undergrowth of jungle, was arriving at the scene of action, breathless, footsore, and faint with hunger. It had been a terrible race. Uh, some regiments have lost a third of their number from fatigue, the men dropping out of the ranks as if shot and left by the side of the road to recover or die at their leisure. Neither was the scene to which they had been invited likely to inspire. The eyes reported only matter for despair. Before us ran the turbulent river, vexed with plunging shells and obscured in spots by blue sheets of low-lying smoke. The two little steamers were doing their duty well. They came over to us empty, and went back, crowded, sitting very low in the water, apparently on the point of capsizing. On the heights above, the battle was burning brightly enough. There were broad flushings in the sky, against which the branches of the trees showed black. The air was full of noises. To the right and the left, the musketry rattled smartly and petulantly. Directly in front, it sighed and growled. There were deep shaking explosions and smart shocks, the whisper of stray bullets and the hurtle of conical shells, the rush of round shot. There were faint cheers. Occasionally, against the glare and behind the trees, could be seen moving black figures, singularly distinct but apparently no longer than a thumb. They seem to me ludicrously like figures of demons in old allegorical prints of hell. To destroy these and all of their belongings, the enemy needed but another hour of daylight. Nay, 
To make his victory sure, it did not need that the sun should pause in the heavens. One of the many random shots falling into the river would have done the business had chance directed it into the engine of one of the steamers. You can perhaps fancy the anxiety which, with which we watched them leaping now. But we had two other allies besides the night. Just where the enemy had pushed his right flank to the river was the mouth of a wide bayou, and here two gunboats had taken station. They too were of the toy sort. They staggered under a heavy gun or two each. The bayou made an opening in the high bank of the river. The bank was a parapet behind which the gunboats crouched, firing up the bayou as through an embrasure. The enemy was at this disadvantage. He could not get at the gunboats, and he could advance only by exposing his flank to their ponderous missiles, one of which would have broken a half mile of his bones and made nothing of it. Very annoying this must have been. These twenty gunners beating back an army because a sluggish creek had been pleased to fall into a river at one point rather than another. Such is the part that accident plays in the game of war. As a spectacle, this was rather fine. We could just discern the black bodies of these boats looking very much like turtles. But when they let off their big guns, there was a conflagration. The river shuddered in its banks and hurried on, bloody, wounded, terrified. Objects a mile away sprang toward our eyes as a snake strikes at the face of his victim. Then we could hear the great shell tearing away through the air until the sound died out in the distance. Then, a surprisingly long time afterward, a dull, distant explosion and a sudden silence of small arms told their own tale. Four. There was, I remember, no elephant on the boat that passed us across that evening. Nor, I think, any hippopotamus. These would have been out of place. We had, however, a woman. She was a fine creature, this woman, somebody's wife. Her mission, as she understood it, was to inspire the failing heart with courage. And when she selected mine, I felt less flattered by her preference than astonished by her penetration. How did she know? She stood on the upper deck of the she stood on the upper deck of the steamboat, with the red blaze of battle bathing her beautiful face, the twinkle of a thousand rifles mirrored in her eyes, and displaying a small ivory-handled pistol. She told me in a sentence punctuated by the thunder of great guns that if it came to the worst, she would do her duty like a man. <clears throat> I am proud to remember that I took my hat off to this little fool. <laughs> Five. By the time my regiment had reached the plateau, night had put an end to the struggle. The gunboats blazed away at set intervals all night long just to make the enemy uncomfortable and break him of his rest. There was no rest for us. Foot by foot, we moved through the dusky fields. We knew not whither. There were men all about us, but no campfires. To have made a blaze would have been madness. They gathered in groups by the wayside. They recounted the depressing incidents of the day. A thoughtful officer shut their mouths with a sharp word as we passed. A wise one coming after encouraged them to repeat their doleful tale all along the line. Hidden in hollows and behind clumps of rank brambles were large tents, dimly lighted with candles, but looking comfortable. The kind of comfort they supplied was indicated by pairs of men entering and reappearing, 
very littered. The low moans from within, and by long rows of dead with covered faces outside. These tents were constantly receiving the wounded, yet they were never full. They were continually ejecting the dead, yet they were never empty. It was as if the helpless had been carried in and murdered, that they might not hamper those whose business was to fall tomorrow. The night was now black, dark. It had begun to rain. Inch by inch we crept along, treading on one another's heels by way of keeping together. Very often we struck our feet against the dead, more frequently against those who still had spirit enough to resent it with a moan. These we lifted carefully to one side and abandoned. Some had sense enough to ask in their weak way for water. Absurd! Their clothes were soaked, their hair dank, their white faces were clammy and cold. Besides, none of us had any water. There was plenty coming, though, for before midnight a thunderstorm broke upon us with great violence. We moved in running water up to our ankles. Happily, we were in a forest, uh, or the enemy standing close to his guns, the disclosures of the lightning might have been inconvenient for us. As it was, the incessant blaze enabled us to consult our watches and encouraged us by displaying our numbers. Our black, sinuous line, creeping like a giant serpent beneath the trees, was apparently interminable. I am almost ashamed to say how sweet I found the companionship of those coarse men. A few inaudible commands from an invisible leader had placed us in order of battle. But where was the enemy? Had our other divisions arrived during the night and passed the river to assist us? Or were we, or were we to oppose our paltry 5,000 breasts to an entire army flushed with victory? What protected our right? Who lay upon our left? Was there really anything in front? There came, born on the raw morning air, the long, weird note of a bugle. It was directly in front of us. It rose with a low, clear, deliberate warble and seemed to float in the gray sky like the note of a lark. The bugle calls of the Federal and Confederate armies were the same. It was the assembly. As it died away, I observed that the atmosphere had suffered a change. It was electric. Wings were growing on blistered feet. Bruised muscles and jolted bones. Shoulders pounded by the cruel knapsack. Eyelids leaden with lack of sleep. All were pervaded by the subtle fluid. All were unconscious of their clay. The men thrust forward their heads, expanded their eyes, and clenched their teeth. They breathed hard as if throttled by tugging at a leash. If you had laid your hand in the beard or hair of one of these men, it would have crackled and shot sparks. Six. I suppose the country lying between Corinth and Pittsburgh Landing could boast a few inhabitants other than alligators. <laughs> what manner of people they were is impossible to say, inasmuch as the fighting dispersed or possibly exterminated them. Perhaps in merely classifying them as non-lizard, I shall describe them with sufficient particularity and at the same time divert from myself the natural suspicion attaching to a writer who points out to persons who do not know him the peculiarities of persons he does not know. One thing, however, I hope I may, without offense, affirm of these swamp dwellers, they were pious. 
to what deity their veneration was given, whether, like the Egyptians, they worshipped the crocodile, or, like other Americans, adored themselves, <laughs> I do not presume the answer. But whoever, or whatever, may have been the divinity whose ends they shaped, unto him, or it, they had builded a temple. This humble edifice, centrally situated in the heart of a forest, and conveniently accessible to crows, had been christened Shiloh Chapel, whence the name of the battle. The fact of a Christian church giving name to a wholesale cutting of Christian throats by Christian hands need not be dwelt on here. The frequency of its recurrence in the history of our species has somewhat abated the moral interest that might otherwise attach to it. So, owing to the darkness, the storm, and the absence of a road, it had been impossible to move the artillery from the ground around the landing. Our batteries were probably toiling after us somewhere. We could only hope that the enemy might delay his attack until they should arrive. He may delay his defense, if he like, said a sententious young officer to whom I had imparted this natural wish. He had read the sign aright. The words were hardly spoken when a group of staff officers about the brigade commander shot as if scattered by a whirlwind and galloping each through the commander of a regiment gave the word. There was a momentary confusion of tongues. A thin line of skirmishers detached itself from the compact front and pushed forward, followed by its diminutive reserves of half a company each, one of which platoons it was my fortune to command. When the straggling line of skirmishers had swept four or five hundred yards ahead, see, said one of my comrades, she moves. Indeed she did and in fine style. Her front is straight as a string, her reserve regiments and columns doubled on the center, following in true subordination. No braying of brass to apprise the enemy, no fifing and drumming to amuse him, no ostentation of gaudy flags. This was a matter of business. Now the evidence of the previous day's struggle was present in profusion. The ground was tolerably level here, the forest less dense, mostly clear of undergrowth, and occasionally opening into small natural meadows. Here there were small pools, mere disks of rainwater with a tinge of blood. Torn with cannon shot, the trunks of the trees pro protruded bunches of splinters, like, like hands, the fingers above and below the wound interlacing with those with those below. Large branches had been lopped off and hung their green heads to the ground. Angular bits of iron sticking in the sides of muddy depressions showed where the shells had exploded in their furrows. Knapsacks, canteens, haversacks distended in soaken and swollen biscuits. Blankets beaten into the soil by the rain, rifles with bent barrels or splintered stocks, waist belts, hats, and the omnipresent sardine box. All the wretched refuse and debris of battle still littered the spongy earth as far as one could see in every direction. Dead horses were everywhere. A few disabled caissons, ammunition wagons standing disconsolate behind four or six sprawling mules. Men? There were men enough. All dead, apparently. Except one. A federal sergeant, variously hurt, who had been a fine giant in his time. He lay face upward, taking in his breath in convulsive, rattling snorts, and blowing it out in sputters of froth which crawled creamily down his cheeks, piling itself alongside his neck and ears. A bullet had 
clipped a groove in his skullch above the temple. From this, the brain protruded in bosses, dropping off in flakes and strings. I had not previously known that one could get on, even in this unsatisfactory fashion, with so little brain. One of my men asked if he should put a bayonet through it. Inexpressibly shocked by the cold-blooded proposal, I told him I thought not. It was unusual. And too many were watching. <laughs> Eight. It was plain that the enemy had retreated to Corinth. The arrival of our fresh troops had disheartened him. Three or four of his gray cavalry videttes moved amongst the trees on the crest of the hill in our front and confirmed us in our belief. An army in the face of the enemy does not use cavalry to screen its front. True, it might have been a general and his staff. Crowding the rise, we found a level field, a quarter of a mile wide, and beyond it, a gentle acclivity covered with an undergrowth of young oaks, impervious to sight. We pushed on into the open, but the division halted at the edge. Having orders to conform to its movements, we halted too, but that did not suit. We received an intimation to proceed. I had performed this sort of service before, and in the exercise of my discretion, deployed my platoon pushing it forward at a run with trailed arms to strengthen the skirmish line, which I overtook some 30 or 40, years, uh, 30 or 40 yards from the wood. Then, I can't describe it. The forest seemed all at once to flame up and disappear with a crash like that of a great wave upon the beach. A crash that expired in hot hissings and the sickening spat of lead against flesh. A dozen of my brave fellows tumbled over like ten pins. Some struggled to their feet, only to go down again, and yet again. Those who stood fired into the smoky brush and doggedly retired. We had expected to find, at most, a line of skirmishers similar to our own. It was with a view to overcoming them that I had thrown forward my little reserve. What we had found was a line of battle, coolly holding its fire until they could count our teeth. <laughs> there was no more to be done but to get back across the open ground, every yard of which was throwing up its little jet of mud provoked by an impinging bullet. But we got back, most of us, and I shall never forget the ludicrous incident of a young officer who had taken part in the affair walking up to his colonel, who had been a calm and apparently impartial spectator, and gravely reporting, The enemy is in force just beyond this field, sir. Nine. In subordination to the design of this narrative, the incidents related necessarily group themselves about my own personality as a center. And as this center, during the few terrible hours of the engagement, maintained a variably constant relationship to this open field, I will describe it. The configuration of the ground offered us no protection. By, by lying flat on our faces between the cannons, we were screened from view by a straggling row of brambles which marked the course of an obsolete fence. But the enemy's grape was sharper than his eyes, and it was poor consolation for us to know that his gunners could not see what they were doing, so long as they were doing it. The shock of our own pieces nearly deafened us, but in the brief intervals, we could hear the battle roaring and stammering in the dark reaches of the forest to the right and to the left, where our other divisions were dashing themselves again and again into the smoking jungle. What would we not have given to join them in their brave, hopeless task? But to 
shall lie down in glorious beneath showers of shrapnel and meekly be blown out of life by level gusts of break. This was horrible. Oh, those cursed guns. Not the enemies, our <laughs> Had it not been for them, we might have died like men. They must be supported, forsooth, the feeble, boasting bullies. It was impossible to conceive that these pieces were doing the enemy as excellent a mischief as his were doing us. And it was with grim satisfaction that I saw the carriage of one after another smashed into matchwood by whooping shot and bundled out of the line. Before we move on, one more map, and the map is going to illustrate something about Sergeant Pierce. Sergeant Pierce, 20 some years later, is not a historian. He did not consider himself a historian. He did not wish to write a factual history. He wished to write his memory. Therefore, anything that made the story better was better for the story. <clears throat> you will hear relate an event that occurred in a ravine some 500 yards from his position. His position would have been here. In the, on the Shiloh battlefield, this is the area known as the Peach Orchard, if you've been to, been to Shiloh. Uh, he belonged to the brigade of General Hazen. Here's the 9th Indiana, and the, the culminating battle in his story, which we shall hear in a minute, in a minute starts here in the Peach Orchard and goes to the southwest and in, in ends in the Daniel Davis wheat field. Nevertheless, never to be deterred by a good story, Sergeant Pierce is now going to describe what he saw in a ravine some 500 yards to the southeast. And so in this, his history is incorrect. And I shall speak for Sergeant Pierce now by saying, he doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't care that I managed to figure out that his timeline is off a little bit. But he is going to uh, tell the story of a uh, his visit to a ravine, which was the site of a story that might be familiar to some of us, the struggle of the 9th Illinois Regiment on the first day of the Battle of Shire. Ten. The dense forests, wholly or partly, in which were fought so many battles of the Civil War, lay upon the earth in each autumn a thick deposit of dead leaves and stems, the decay of which forms a soil of surprising depth and richness. The dry, in dry weather, the upper stratum is flammable as tinder and a fire once kindled in it will spread with a slow, persistent advance as far as local conditions will permit, leaving a bed of light ashes, light ashes beneath which the less combustible accretions of the previous years will smolder until extinguished by flames. In many of the engagements of the war, the fallen leaves took fire and roasted the fallen men. At Shiloh, during the first day's fighting, wide tracts of woodland were burned over in this way, and scores of wounded who might have recovered perished in slow torture. I remember a deep ravine, in which by some mad freak of heroic incompetence, a part of an Illinois regiment had been surrounded, and refusing to surrender was destroyed, as they very well deserved. <laughs> My regiment, having at last been relieved from the guns, for no obvious purpose, I obtained leave to go down into the valley of death to gratify a reprehensible curiosity. The fire had swept every foot of it, and at every step I sank into ashes up to my ankle. It had contained the thick undergrowth of young saplings, every one of which had been severed by a bullet and afterward burnt and the stumps were charred. Death had put its sickle into this thicket and fire had 
gleaned the field. Along a line which was not that of extreme depression, but equidistant from the heights on either hand, lay the bodies, half buried in ashes. Some, in the unlovely looseness of attitude, denoting sudden death by the bullet, but by far the greater number in postures of agony that told of the tormenting clay. Their clothing was half burnt away, their hair and beard entirely. The rain had come too late to save their nails. Some were swollen to double girth, others shriveled to mannequins. According to the degree of exposure, their faces were bloated and black or yellow and shrunken. The contraction of muscles that had given them claws for hands had cursed each countenance with a hideous grin. Fa! I cannot catalog the charms of these gallant gentlemen who had got what they enlisted. For fifteen hours we had been wet to the skin, profoundly disgusted with the inglorious part to which we had been condemned. The men of my regiment did everything doggedly. Blue sheets of powder smoke filled the air with their peculiar, pungent odor. For miles on either hand could be heard the hoarse murmur of the battle. We had been placed again in rear of those guns. But even they and their antagonists had seemed to tired of the feud, pounding away at one another with amiable infrequency. The right of the regiment extended a little beyond the field. On the prolongation of the line in that direction were some regiments of another division, with one in, and with one in reserve. The line of forest bounding the end of the field stretched straight as a wall, from the right of my regiment to heaven knows what regiment of the enemy. There suddenly appeared, marching down along this wall, not more than 200 yards in our front, of a few dozen gray-clad men with rifles on the right shoulder. At an interval of perhaps 50 yards behind them, they were followed by half as many more. And an affair supporting distance of these stalked with confident stride a single man. <laughs> there seemed to me something indescribably ludicrous in the advance of this handful of men upon an army, albeit with their left flank covered by force. It does not so impress me now. They were the exposed flanks of three lines of infantry each half a mile in length. In a moment, our gutters had grappled with the nearest pieces and swung them half around and were pouring streams of canister into the wood. The infantry rose in masses, springing into line. Our threatened regiments stood like a wall, their loaded rifles at the ready. The right flank of my own regiment was thrown back slightly to threaten the flank of the assault. Then the storm burst. A great cloud seemed to spring out of the forest and into the faces of the waiting battalions. It was received with a crash that made the trees turn up their leaves. In one instant, the assailants paused above their own dead. Then they struggled forward. One moment, and those unmoved men in blue would be impaled. What were they about? Were they stunned by their own volley? Their inaction was maddening. Another tremendous crash. The rear rank had fired. Humanity, thank heaven, is not made for this. And the shattered gray mass drew back a score of paces. Lead had scored its old time victory over steel. The heroic had broken its great heart upon the commonplace. There are those who say that it is sometimes otherwise. All of this
this had taken but a minute of time. And now the second Confederate line swept down and poured in its fire. The line of blue staggered and gave way. In those, in those two terrific volleys, it seemed to have quite poured out its spirit. To this deadly work, our reserves now came up on a run. It was surprising to see them spitting fire with never a sound, for such was the infernal din that the ear could take in no more. This fearful scene was enacted within fifty paces of our toes, but we were rooted to the ground as though we were grown there. But now, our commanding officer rode from behind the front, waved his hand with a courteous gesture that says, Après vous, <laughs> and with a barely audible cheer, we sprang into the fight. Again, the smoking front of gray receded, and again the enemy's third line emerged from its leafy covert. It pushed forward across the piles of dead and wounded to threaten with protruded steel. As matters stood, we were now very evenly matched, and how long we might have held out, God only knows. But all at once, something appeared to have gone wrong with the enemy's left. Our men had somewhere pierced his line. A moment later, his whole front gave way, and springing forward with fixed bayonets, we pushed him in utter confusion back to his original line. Here, our broken and disordered regiments, inextricably intermingled and drunken with the wine of triumph, dashed confidently against a pair of battalions, provoking a tempest hissing of lead that made us stagger under its very weight. The sharp onset of another against our flank sent us whirling back with fire at our heels and fresh foes in merciless pursuit, who, in their turn, were broken upon the front of our reserves. As we rallied to reform behind our beloved guns and noted the ridiculous brevity of our line. As we sank from sheer fatigue and tried to moderate the terrific thumping of our hearts, there swept past us and over us and into the open field a long regiment with fixed bayonets and rifles on the right shoulder. Another followed, and another, two, three, four, Heavens! Heavens, where do all of these men come from? And why did they not come before? <laughs> How grandly and confidently they go sweeping on like long blue waves of ocean chasing one another to the cruel rocks. Involuntarily, we draw in our feet beneath us as we sit, ready to spring up and interpose our breasts when these gallant lines shall come back to us across that terrible field with spouting fire at their back. We still are breathing to catch the full grandeur of the volleys that are to tear them to shreds. Minute after minute passes, and the sound does not come. Then, for the first time, we note that the silence of the whole region is not comparative, but absolute. Have we become stone deaf? See, here comes a stretcher bearer, and there a surgeon. Good heavens, a chaplain! The battle was indeed at an end. And this was oh so long ago. How they come back to me, dimly and brokenly, but with what a magic stuff. Those years of youth, when I was soldiering. Again, I hear the far warble of blown bugles. Again, I see the tall blue smoke of campfires ascending from the dim valleys of Wonderland. 
There steals upon my sense the ghost of an odor from pines that canopy an ambush. I feel upon my cheek the morning mist that shrouds the hostile camp, unaware of its doom, and my blood stirs at the ringing rifle shot of the solitary sentinel. Unfamiliar landscapes, glittering with sunshine or sullen with rain, come to me, demand recognition, pass, vanish, and give place to others. Here in the night stretches a wide and blasted field, studded with half-extinct fires, burning redly with I know not what presage of evil. Again, I shudder as I note its desolation and its awful silence. Where was it? To what monstrous inharmony of death was it the visible prey? Oh, days when the world was beautiful and strange, when unfamiliar constellations burned in the southern midnights, and the mockingbird poured out his heart in the moon-gilded magnolia, when there was something new under a new sun. Will your fine, far memories ever cease to lay contrasting pictures athwart the harsher features of this later world, accentuating the ugliness of the longer and tamer life? Is it not strange that the phantoms of a blood-stained period have so airy a grace and look with so tender eyes that I recall with difficulty the danger and death and horrors of the time and without effort all that was gracious and picturesque. Ah, youth, there is no such wizard as thou. Give me but one touch of thine artist hand upon the dull canvas of the present. Gild but for one moment the drear and somber scenes of today. And I will willingly surrender another life than the one I should have thrown away at Shiloh. Time for questions, John. I can entertain questions, but if we're out of time. Questions? All right. Jerry? <coughs> Given the, I'll call it sarcastic wit, how well was... Big time! <laughs> well, how well was this essay received by other veterans? Mm. Yeah, uh, for the camera, when the question is, given the, the sarcasm of the essay, how was it received by other veterans? I cannot answer the question accurately because I don't know how this essay was received by other veterans. I do know that Pierce had a rather um, fraught relationship with other veterans. He especially had a rather fraught relationship with veterans organizations. He certainly considered the Grand Army the Republic and other veteran-based uh, political action uh, organizations to be uh, uh, corrupt embarrassments to the service that the uh, soldiers had done. He also, for all of, his, all of his misanthropy, he also hung on to a, a rather abolitionist view of how the war ought to have turned out. And so he, part of the bitterness, he, sees, he does seem to have aged with a uh, severe disappointment 
out of over the outcome of uh, uh, Reconstruction and uh, the the overthrow of Reconstruction and the overthrow of civil rights for the freed people. Um, and uh, I, I think it's just as happy to be in San Francisco and as far away from the whole battlefield as it possibly could be. Uh, but he carried on some very uh, pointed public controversies with public veterans. Uh, he was always there to be throwing darts at Sherman after a speech or sheriff or you know, one of these, you know, one of these high, high profile veterans. Questions? Right here. What do you think happened to yours? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That would be the most honest answer I can give to anybody. Uh, for anybody that does, maybe, maybe doesn't know the end of the beer story, in 1914, at the age of 70 or 72, uh, old, the old reporter decided he was going to go to Mexico and do an interview with Pancho B. <laughs> that interview was never written. <laughs> and uh, Ambrose Pierce in 1914 disappeared somewhere in Mexico. Never <laughs> yeah. Well, that he did go back to the battlefield. He did. Before, before, before he disappeared. Oh. Excellent point. Excellent point, David. Uh, because I think that might say something about his mental state when he decided, I'm going to go interview Pancho Villa. He, first, he went on a tour of his old battlefields, and he returned to Shiloh. He saw these places. He had already written the essay, so he used this visit to uh, write the essay. But he returned to his old stomping grounds, his old battlefields. He did that tour of his youth, and then he disappeared into, uh, into Mexico. Uh, of course, there are plenty of romantic stories, and of course, he did get killed by Pancho Villa or anybody else, and maybe he took a beautiful young Mexican bride in such a far and quiet in some of the Chihuahua. All right, well, if there are any other questions, thank you very much.